Thinking Big with Steve Bartilla. Brought to you by... There's really not much that's more exciting to me than going in absolutely cold to a new chunk of public ground. So how do you do that? Well, the first thing I do is I get my hands on some very, very high quality aerial photography. Aerial photography and topo maps. Um, <clears throat> in my case, luckily I work with Northwoods Mapping, so I just call up Scott and say, Scott, I need this area, and for a few dollars he takes care of it for me. <clears throat> when you are studying these maps and photos, what you're really looking for is going to depend on how heavily hunted this area is. If it is truly pummeled, what I'm looking for is where everybody else doesn't go. I'm looking for those barriers that people aren't going to cross. I'm looking for that overlooked spot that's right next to the road that nobody, no idiot, is going to go in there because they're way too darn good hunters. Um, <clears throat> but at the same time, a heavily hunted deer, how does a muck get to be mature? He gets to be mature by doing what he's not supposed to do. He gets to be mature by being where we're not. So that is exactly what I'm trying to find in that situation. I'm looking for barriers and overlooked stuff. That really, really deep gully that a person has to cross to get to the backside. The gut-busting, lung-searing ridge that you have to climb. Man, I'll tell you what. I sometimes swear hunters are, are allergic to water because we are... You have a water body that you can't cross with just regular regular rubber boots. You have to put on hip boots or, God forbid, you have to drag out a canoe. You got that backside all to yourself. Um, <clears throat> uh, clear cuts. Those, those really, really thick regrowths of clear cuts. You bust your way through to the other side of that, and you often have that to yourself. I'm looking for those air on pressured deer. I'm looking for those areas that everyone isn't because that is where those mature bucks are going to be. If they're living where we're hunting, they didn't get to be mature. Okay, I'm finding those on that aerial photos and the topo maps. When it's not overly heavily pressured, remember watching Sesame Street when you were a kid? One of these things is not like the other. One of these things does not belong. That is exactly what I'm looking for in big wood settings. My numbers are going to be off a little bit here, but you know what? It'll make the point. 90% of big woods whitetails spend 90% of their time in 10% of the deer woods. And we can even take it a step further and say 10% of the hunters are the ones that are killing them because they are zeroing in on that 10% of the woods. How do you do that? What you do is, as I said, sing that Sesame Street song. Find those abnormalities. If it is a hard and soft deciduous, <coughs> deciduous tree woods and I can find some uh, stand of conifers, you know what, I'm, I'm scouting those conifers. If it's mainly big woods without much water, hey, I'm scouting that water for sure. If there's a swamp and otherwise dry land, you darn right, I'm going after that swamp, especially if there's a peninsula of dry land going out in there. That peninsula is going to be golden. Um, <clears throat> look for those fresh clear cuts. Look for that rogue meadow out in the middle of the timber. Look for what is abnormal. And when you go in there to scout, what you do is you're you're looking on your photos, you're looking at your topo maps, the topo maps, you're looking for benches, you're looking for saddles, you're looking for ridge systems, <clears throat> you're looking for really nasty erosion cuts coming up the side of that ridge that all those deer need to wrap that tip or go down to the bottom to cross. Find those topographical funnels off the topos. Find those oddball characteristics within the habitat. Create a list to go out and scout these locations. When you are at those locations, if it looks promising at all, go ahead and create yourself a mock scrape. You create that mock scrape, you give it a couple days, you come back and you check for tracks. When you find those mock scrapes with those great big tracks, there's no guarantee that it's got a great big rack on its head, but you know what? Odds are a lot better than when you're hunting mock scrapes with those little tiny tracks. Those are just some tricks that I use when it comes to going in cold. Hunting Big with Steve Bartilla. Brought to you by... When it 
it comes to going in cold, go ahead, get your hands on some photos and some, uh, some contour maps. Gauge the amount of pressure the area is going to get. Public land, big woods, rarely is heavily pressured, even in states like Michigan, Pennsylvania, or Wisconsin during bow season. Gun season, it's a completely different animal. All of a sudden, we're running all over the place out there. Um, when it's high pressure, I'm looking for areas that other people aren't going to go because how does Mr. Big get to be Mr. Big on heavily pressured ground? They get to be Mr. Big by not being where they're supposed to be or where we're hunting. Okay, um, If it's low pressure, I'm singing that Sesame Street song. I'm looking for what is unique in that habitat. Keeping in mind that 90% of the deer spend 90% of their times in 10% of the, the big woods, I'm looking for that 10% by zeroing in on topographical funnels, by zeroing in on those oddball features, water and otherwise dry areas, swamps, um, clear, fresh clear cuts, meadows. You go ahead and take that approach. You go out there with your checklist. I'm going to go here, 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 here. And every one of those locations that look good, you go ahead and you create yourself a mock scrape. You come back a few days later and you look for those big tracks. You do those things and you know what? You can take your game up and yet another level.